why don't we talk about history for a little bit for people in the in the pa- parrot room patreon um i just have a couple of questions that i never got around to really asking you in a previous podcast and i wanted yes. to ask you them the death of god is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life where do we stand in the illusion it makes what kind of space are we invited into the material relations between people become social relations between things when we look at toasters corn and tvs we don't we see still them. to a large extent live in the interregnum between so between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. I'm hoping that we're not actually live. Um, doesn't look like we are. So, uh, Chris Catrone is uh, back again. Uh, he is everyone's favorite Marxist, the last Marxist former president of the Platypus Affiliate Society, art professor, and video artist as well. Um, and today, Chris is coming back after his uh, uh, appearance on so- the Sublation Magazine show where we talked about Star Wars. And I- I'm just hoping to pick your brain, Chris, about Adorno's um, criticism or approach to art. What, how did his Marxism... Uh, influence his understanding of art and and how can Marxists approach the world of art whether it's popular culture or fine art mm-hmm. today so that's that's how we're going to start very big huge it you is know, a you should teach topic. a seminar kind of or a, like a whole semester on a it, whole right? semester yeah which indeed I do so mm-hmm. you know it's a kind of a vexed issue with um, with Adorno because he is pigeonholed as a uh, elitist and as a Mandarin intellectual and as expressing a kind of old fashioned sensibility that's mm-hmm. hostile to 20th century popular culture. And that's just not accurate. So again, among various writings of Adorno, um, but also others like Walter Benjamin, um, and then even kind of non Marxist, but in the same orbit like Siegfried Krakauer, mm-hmm. There is this um, attention to popular culture. And unfortunately, starting in the 60s, people started, readers started sort of creating a kind of debate, like Benjamin and Krakauer on one side in favor of popular culture and Adorno on the other side hostile to popular culture. And that's Yeah, that's how, that's how I conceive of Benjamin and, and Adorno. And it's not, you know, it's neither the case that Adorno is simply against uh, mass culture in the 20th century, nor is it the case that um, Krakauer and Benjamin are just uh, kind of boosters for or legitimating of or justifying or affirmative, right? Mm-hmm. So um, so I was thinking about this. So, you know, I did my little foray into in August of this year into cultural criticism with two articles, right? So there was the article for Sublation on the Star Wars prequels, Mm -hmm. Um, And then there was an article for Compact Magazine on Ozark, the TV show that Mm -hmm. just ended this year. Mm -hmm. So those two articles um, I see as complementing each other. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the Ozark article came out first. And that article, I kind of began with a a phrase of Adorno's um, or with a little summation of Adorno. Um, So I said, Adorno wrote that the splinter in one's eye is the best magnifying lens. He advocated a kind of paranoid criticism, one that overestimates its object and exaggerates its meaning, using the microcosm of the cultural phenomenon to illuminate the surrounding social world. In this view, art and theory alike exist to provoke recognition to make vivid what is otherwise only dimly perceived. So, again, that's not particularly Marxist, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. Adorno has some language to talk about this. So paranoid criticism that comes from surrealism, it comes from Andre Breton, and it does have a kind of Freudian kind of dimension to it. And it is of course influenced by Marxism as well, but it's not particularly Marxist. You could say it's maybe Hegelian and Freudian perhaps. Um, Adorno wrote an essay called Cultural Criticism in Society. And there he kind of makes this argument about the two different kinds of cultural critique 
imminent and transcendental. And he says, well, of course, you, it has to be both, even though these are in contradiction to each other. Mm-hmm. So the imminent criticism is basically taking the object on its own terms and working through it, the terms that it establishes, like its kind of formal parameters. Um, you know, so in, in kind of theoretical imminent critique, like Marx's critique of political economy, he accepts all the terms of bourgeois political economy and works through them imminently. Transcendental critique is sort of going beyond the object. Now, the danger of imminent critique is that it can become just a justification. It can become affirmative of the object. It can seem like, oh, Marx is just sort of agreeing with bourgeois political economy. That's the danger of imminent critique. The danger of transcendental critique is that you can imagine that you are somehow above the object as opposed to in it. Mm -hmm. And actually, what Adorno says is just when you think you're above the object, you're actually below the object. Mm-hmm. Right now, you know, so someone like Adorno, who's a Marxist cultural critic, and me, like I'm, you know, writing on Star Wars, Ozark, mm-hmm. um, you know, am I superior to these things? What would what would that mean? Does it mean that I understand these things better than their creators did, or better than your average viewer does? Well, that would be one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it is that these things are just social facts, to use a kind of Durkheim sociology mm. uh, kind of language. And obviously they're out there, they're being viewed by millions and millions of people. My essays might be read by thousands of people at most. You know, they're above me in the sense that they have a preponderant reality and are being processed by millions of people in a way that is totally beyond anything that I could say theoretically or critically. In other words, they just are part of social reality. And that's really the point of cultural critique, is that these things are part of social reality. They're not kind of ancillary to, or kind of epiphenomenal to, or kind of, um, you know, dispensable in some way. You know, people always live in a society and in a political environment that has culture, that has aesthetic objects. Those things are intrinsically part of that reality. And so Mm -hmm. I Marx in that 1843 letter to Ruga for the ruthless criticism of everything existing, he -hmm. says, well, we could start anywhere. We could start with law. We could start with religion. We could start with philosophy. We could start with political economy. You could also say we could start with art and culture. Mm -hmm. And indeed, many, many uh, political critics of modern society did start with cultural objects, whether it's like Baudelaire or Mm -hmm. live much later, the Frankfurt School. So it's just it's it's an interesting thing about like what are you trying to do? Because I'm not, you know, I wasn't trying to enter into the realm of bourgeois journalism, you know, namely kind of taste adjudication mm-hmm. or kind of a, opinionation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, rather, you know, so th- the trick is how do you address something that is greater than you? including mm-hmm. any cultural object, you know, obviously Star Wars, mm-hmm. millions of people have seen it. Ozark, mm-hmm. millions of people have seen it, won some awards, whatever, mm-hmm. you know, and one, by the way, like Ozark is like one, one object I took up is very like this year or the last few years. It's it mm-hmm. went four seasons. So very much of like the Trump Biden era and then Star Wars, which is more about a g- generational reality, whether mm-hmm. our generation, generation X, or like it's dominated our culture or the millennials it's dominated their culture too and that's why the prequel films it's kind of their it's their childhood culture well, well chris i i haven't seen the final season of ozark but i did watch the first two seasons right um yeah so i want to i want to talk to you about ozark and get your not your opinions but i right. guess your your eminent and then transcendental critique but i want to um mm-hmm just stay in this realm of the abstract for a second about uh-huh. the role of the criti- critic mm-hmm. and point out to you that by far the majority of work that's written as maybe by journalists mm-hmm. critiquing or uh, reviewing popular culture today does tend to take the position of being above the object yeah. Yeah. Um, of the critique. And, and I wonder the degree to which 
those critics, despite having a smaller audience, might at times be above the objects. And I'll give you an example. Dr. Seuss. Mm. Dr. <laughs> Seuss <laughs> was read by millions, hugely right. popular, is right. hugely popular uh, author of children's books. Um, I was very stunned. Yeah. Um, but for years, there was a criticism of Dr. Seuss as, as a uh, imperialist, uh, racist uh, author and um, that developed in the academy and then uh, slowly entered uh, the realm the of politics. Mm -hmm. Not the mainstream, but the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. um, so what got Dr. Seuss to the point where they were pulling books off the shelf voluntarily was the fact that the Democrats, um, the, the, the fact that the, the education, through educational. The, yeah. The state had been supporting Seuss so, and, and ordered in a symbiotic way because Dr. Seuss was so popular. Buying they had these, yeah. They had, they had um, a literacy program for children that they wanted to push forward. So okay. associating that literacy program with Dr. Seuss right. became a way to both provide state money for the continuation of the legacy of Dr. Seuss. Yeah. So that was assured. Yeah. And then also to help uh, the literacy program seem relevant and popular and, and oh, sure. yeah, good, yeah. right. So, but that became a problem right? because of the way elite opinion had been changed. Shaped. Um, and so that elite opinion was above the object and then uh, had a, 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 a well, and then had some, I mean, I don't know where Dr. Seuss sit, is situated today, but books were then pulled off the shelf, you know, um, yeah. not only just that you could no longer purchase them even on eBay. Um, well, they canceled some of his books. Yeah. So I, I vaguely recall this. So, okay, so about the superiority and inferiority. So, yeah. okay, I mean, look, I do this too. So, you know, like film criticism or television criticism, like mm -hmm. in the popular culture, journalistic reviewing criticism. Like, I will read reviews to help decide whether I'm going to go see a movie, but also after I've seen a movie. Like, it's kind of like, I'm not sure how I think about this. How are people talking about this? So there's a kind of an authoritarian dynamic where we do look to others, expert reviewers, to form our own opinion of things. And to yeah, form I, I've... I'm take. guilty of telling my kids after we've watched a movie, they'll ask me, what do I think? And I say, I don't know. I'm going to go read some reviews. Right. And they're I mean, like, and they're, and they're like, what is wrong with you? What's Dad? wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I remember, you know, like obviously when you're younger, you do think, well, I don't need anyone else to tell me, mm -hmm. but actually you, you kind of do. And, you know, that's an interesting phenomenon in and of itself. So the mm -hmm. idea though would be that again, just when you think you're superior to the object, you're actually inferior to it. And one way in which that's the case is that you, the critic will try to resolve the object in a way that the object actually is not resolved. And that's its power and that's its potentiality and that's its critical character actually, is that it is contradictory, it's ambiguous, it's ambivalent, and but it's really contradictory and that that happens at an experiential level rather than at a discursive conceptual level. And that when you try to resolve it conceptually or just merely discursively, like in the journalistic discourse of cultural criticism, that you're missing it. You're actually missing it. And so thinking that you're above it, you're actually below it. Right. And that's that's what I tried to bring out in different ways in, in my in my two pieces. And it was kind of like. How do you do that? Because I didn't do imminent dialectical critique. I didn't try to get into like self-contradiction and that kind of thing, because I felt like that would have demanded a, a different kind of approach to like the medium and the form. And it would not exactly be appropriate. And I, also I wanted it to be political. What, what, what would have made it inappropriate to do to do that? Well, it, it, you know, I already in the Star Wars article for Sublation, mm. I already felt like, OK, are people going to be interested in this kind of discussion of the work? You know, because <clears throat> it already felt like it was shading into too much formalism, whereas the Ozark article, I didn't deal with that at all. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I dealt with it 
only at the level. So, you know, Raymond Williams has a good way of talking about art and literature. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. says that works of art are structures of feeling. Mm -hmm. Right. That that's what the work of art is. Right. It's not making a discursive argument. It's not logical. It gives you a structure of feeling. So as an aesthetic object and of course, structure of feeling, which also means like as a cultural object, it captures something about the way people feel about things. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, and again, it's like if you try to describe that, it's a little bit of a problem discursively, but also if you try to resolve it. So I think that I mentioned in the magazine show, Adorno wrote a piece called How to Look at Television. Mm -hmm. And there he talks about the overt message and the covert message. And it's not just about television. It's also about like popular music and film, but also popular literature like, you know, like novels. I've, I've read this and I remember him describing detective programs, particularly yes. in that. Yeah, crime, right? Mm -hmm. So exactly. In other words, that, the overt message is you want the good guys to win and you want law to be enforced and you want social morality to be, you know, established. Covertly, you want the bad guys to win. You want crime to be committed, right? Like you want to you want to rebel against the society. And, you know, at the deepest levels of a kind of nihilism of a kind of like, no, I don't accept any of these values, actually. Mm -hmm. Right. And that. That's why people are watching it. They're watching it for both. And of course it exploits that. The medium exploits that. And the, the producers more or less self-consciously exploit that. They do. And you know, people have talked about this in terms of like the carnivalesque, you know, like that that art and culture is a place where you can go to break the morals. Mm -hmm. Right? It's a kind of a it's a kind of a sanctioned kind of rebellion that's contained within like the cultural sphere and the artistic sphere. It's where you can go against society and not suffer any consequences for it. Mm -hmm. Right. And obviously that's, that's like a long standing thing. You could say the whole history of civilization art forms have that character. And then in capitalism, obviously it has a, it has a, a greater currency because, you know, this is the first culture where we can mass distribute cultural objects in this way you know, and reach like millions and billions of people within a short amount of time and really capture something about the zeitgeist, mm -hmm. you know? So it, 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 it both is and is not like the way it's been in the history of civilization more generally. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's a kind of a truism about art and culture, but it's also something specific and pointed in capitalism. Mm -hmm. Right. But again, that, that kind of discussion is more like at a psychological level and at a kind of social morality and maybe political level, because also I think Adorno talks about the depiction of political events, like the depiction of like coup d'etats and revolutions and, you know, and who's the hero and who's the villain. And, you know, it's, it's all very complicated. And I also feel like what's interesting is that television was, was actually broader in subject matter in the 50s and 60s than it is now. Like yeah, I know. Uh, yeah. Much more formulaic now. Well, kind of like the internet. Um, huh, right. In this early days was broader um, and now is, is narrowing down and That's everything's right. going to look like TikTok um, eventually. <laughs> <I know>. uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, I, I, I just decided the problem of, of uh, focusing on a kind of a formalist uh, critique. And I think that you also. Uh, talked about journalistic approaches to art that revolve around taste, right? Um, something you want to avoid. And I, I feel as though that I kind of n am nostalgic for the mm. kind of reviews that would that focus had, uh, on taste and yeah. that would be formal, because yeah. um, we we don't tend to get that anymore. Now we have these very socially aware criticisms. Um, oh, that totally ignores the object. Right, and doesn't allow us to even discuss. The aesthetic or stylistic character. Right on our own channel, we we started to do a culture podcast at the beginning, and I found that I was not happy with the way in which we were discussing films. Um, and no, I said, so let awesome. us instead take a formalist approach for a while. Uh -huh. Yeah, let's do Red Dawn, not from the perspective of politics, but as a, a kind of film. And does oh, it an operate action film. Absolutely. like an, uh, an action film, and you know, yeah. situate it within that 
that that uh, arena. What, you know, what is Hollywood? The old Red Dawn is better than the new Red Dawn. Oh well, Clearly. you know, like in other just, words, that's not the only area, but yes. Also politically, <laughs> also like literarily, you know, like yeah. and all sorts of levels, but just on the face of it, formally. Oh, for sure. Do you know? Yeah. <laughs> and that's yeah. Even like. Do you know, like, it's a funny, it's, it's so, so yeah, what, so, you know, I kind of miss Roger Ebert already, but, you know, back in the day, like a Pauline Kael, mm -hmm. you know, like there were, you know, and again, so now I think that people are, uh, journalists are more wary of doing that kind of all round kind of criticism, mm -hmm. you know, where you could get into the social, political, aesthetic, like the relationship of these things, mm -hmm. um, because, uh, well, I mean, I do think that um, the readers, for sure, but also maybe the writers have lost a sense of the history. No, it's the writers first, more than the readers who have lost a sense of it. And you could just, and it's a generational shift. It is it a is. generational shift, and that's um, really unfortunate to say it. But anyway, so this is poor Adorno. I'm <laughs> suddenly in the position of poor Adorno of being a crotchety old man who's like, you kids don't understand anything, <laughs> right, right. you know, and you have no appreciation. I mean, it's, it's awful. So, you know, so it's, it's very tricky wading into this domain. So what, what started me on the path was, you know, the, the controversy around compact magazine was the culture wars mm -hmm. and they lost their leftist editor, Edwin Aponte, because he objected to their partisanship, their right wing partisanship in the culture wars. And they wanted me to write something else. Was that though. why? Is that why he left? Yeah, that's why he left. He wrote an article in the Bellows about it. Oh, okay. It's good. Mm -hmm. And so um, basically, I, they wanted me to write something right away after my ends of, end of millennial Marxism. And I just thought, oh, what am I going to do? And especially the abortion decision had come down. And I thought, well, no. Right. I'm not going to wade into the culture wars. Rather, I'm going to kind of call their bluff on the culture wars and I'm going to do cultural criticism, mm -hmm. especially because they had published some cultural reviews, mm -hmm. you know, some art reviews that I thought were a little weak. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and Ozark, it's funny, Ozark gets favorable mention on Fox News. And so is it a Trumpist show? Hmm. Or not. I don't think that it is. But it was seen as such by some of these right wing people. And why? What was it about the Ozark that they thought was? Well, for instance, uncertain? because it depicted election rigging by Democrats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and so just straight up. And I don't think that that's partisanship on the part of Ozark. I think that's just an, an artist or artists just commenting on contemporary reality because it does exist. You know, there is mm -hmm. vote rigging. Does it make a huge difference in elections? Probably not, but it exists. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and the Republicans do it and the Democrats do it. And in fact, in the TV show, it was left a little ambiguous. It might have been the Republicans who were doing it. Because mm -hmm. I think that the character was a Democrat, and then she was having to make a deal with someone who hated her from her days as a political consultant, as a Democrat, who I think was clearly a Republican. Mm -hmm. And then I think she had to go along with his election machine vote rigging so they kind of twisted it up like they do that this is what the culture does it kind of right. you know, takes things and then like mixes it up and again you know that's great because it's just and like that a, actually if there was vote rigging right that is probably how it would really happen because after all it was only uh, with trump that the people who were so concerned about vote rigging became republicans and conservatives oh right you know right. Right. for the last 15 years before that with Bush and oh, Kerry yeah. and, and Gore, it was all, oh, there was Bush a whole, the, and well, Bush Bush Gore, and, and, and Kerry, even after Kerry, too, oh, yeah. there was a whole little industry about how that vote had been rigged. You know, there were people who, Oh yeah. Their and the Democrats have been saying that for a long time. Yeah. So it's just, it's just, it's a funny thing. So, but again, art can do that because it can present things in a more ambiguous way. Mm -hmm. And it really is not making an argument. It's not like making a political argument. It's not propaganda in mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. Of course it can be, but generally speaking. When it's it, good, it generally isn't. I mean, for the most it part. Isn't. And right. so what it does is it put things, it puts things out there for us to like think about, but really, first of all, 
how do we feel about it? Mm-hmm. You know, and how do we feel about it situationally with regard to characters and how they're navigating this world that mm-hmm. both is like our world, but also is this kind of exaggerated version of our world. You know, again, it's this kind of dream world, strange, weird, like uh, estranged version of our of ourselves, even when it's very kind of realistic. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, because it is exaggerated and, you know, and you do know that reality is stranger than fiction and, you know, the reality is more brutal than could ever be depicted on screen. And yet it also feels like the, what's on screen is much more sensational than one's everyday life is. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, it, it sort of plays in that arena and, you know, so it's just, so I, you know, decided to make the intervention on cultural criticism and then that sort of got, uh, Gene Bajalan, to invite me to write this Star Wars article. Right. Um, and, you know, so I felt like, okay, the genie's out of the bottle. Now I'm a cultural critic. I don't think I'm going to return to that for a while, though. I'm going to... Okay. But what was it... Okay, so what? what is your perspective? I'm really interested to know on uh, on the television show Ozark. First of all, mm-hmm. do you think that it is uh, the kind of work of art that does, is deserving of cultural critique? Um, that it has something significant to offer uh, yes. when you take the time to reflect on it. And that's right. So, okay. So that's, yeah. So the funny thing about Ozark, so it's like four seasons, right? Mm-hmm. And it's one of these things that I think um, my partner and I started watching before the pandemic, mm-hmm. or maybe we caught up with it under the pandemic. I think the show started before the pandemic. It but did. Maybe we only started watching it in the pandemic, you know, because we're like, stuck at home and we have to watch all these things, you know? Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure that I liked the show the first couple of seasons actually. Mm -hmm. And, but you know, you just, it's our show, you know, it's our us time, you know, this is what we'll watch on TV now, you know, we can agree on something to watch and are either of us particularly passionate about it? Not necessarily, but we both like it enough to watch it together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it's a little bit of a, a family ritual like that. And, you know, so it's not like my favorite show or anything. It's not like, you know, the most interesting or most complicated show. There are many other shows that I find much more kind of compelling and interesting, but it did cap- capture something. You know, in other words, I did have something to say about it. Right. Mm-hmm. And so then the question is, what kind of intervention am I going to make? And that's, again, the position of the cultural critic is you shouldn't be doing something redundant. In other words, what you write should be necessary in some way, like a necessary addition to Mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. object. Um, And, you know, it really like that quotation from the beginning of my article, you know, points out, can I call attention to something that might just slip by otherwise? And especially to a certain, you know, because I was aware of my audience, because my, you know, the, the compact audience is right wing. And they are kind of right social Democrats or something. And, you know, they're not economically conservative. They're economically kind of liberal. You know, they'd like to see more of a welfare state, less free marketism, et cetera. Mm -hmm. They'd like to see some kind of tempered capitalism. And, you know, and of course, there's a greater kind of millennial thought about that. Um, There's a kind of nostalgia for the Fordist era. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that struck me about the show was that... um, the, the setting is this kind of WPA works progress administration, like Tennessee Valley authority kind of space, even though it predates it. Mm-hmm. So it's, it, it was done right before the new deal and it was done as a private project, but it was done as a big corporate project. You know, in other words, flooding, flooding some towns in order to create a reservoir in order to set up a hydroelectric dam facility, etc. And so it's all about, you know, how the people are just at the mercy of these huge capitalist forces, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so it's kind of like, is this what you want? You know, do you want the state to do it instead of private capital? Do you want, you know, what, 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 what exactly is your vision, especially because they're like populist, you know, they're Mm -hmm. like, oh, well, the left populist and the right populist should come together. It's like populism. And so I felt like I had an intervention to make to a particular audience, but also a broader audience than that. Mm-hmm. I felt like I was picking up on things that the producers probably intended. And so I felt like if the producers of the show read my article, 
they would not be like, oh, Chris Catron's just talking out his ass. They mm -hmm. would, you know, they would, I would be, you know, dealing with things on their, in their terms. And I was also inspired by a Jacobin article on Mad Men that I thought was horrible because it like regretted the, the end of Mad Men. Um, and you kind of missed the point of Mad, Mad Men, you know, in a way that I thought was typical for the millennials, which is that they don't, they don't understand the anti-hero character. And they also, one of the reasons why they can't understand the anti-hero character is that they can't really deal with that. In other words, they can't deal with an, an actual bad guy as the protagonist. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, so, you know, people think Tony Soprano is ultimately a good guy. It's like, he's not a good guy. Like, you right. know, <laughs> in your mind, you might try to turn him into a good guy, but he's clearly not a good guy. And neither was Don Draper. You know, right. he, he, like, clearly he's not a good guy in the end. And, you know, and then there are more recent shows that I felt like kind of fudged the issue, you know, like Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. And then Walter was, White was also not a good guy. Well, he's not a good guy. You know, it's funny because um, I remembered it slightly differently than it was because then I happened to see an episode and I was like, wait, OK, what? But but he he doesn't sacrifice Jesse. He does rescue Jesse from the white supremacist gang. He does he ultimately does the right thing. He does. And you know, whereas Tony Soprano, no. Everybody yeah. you know. There's but no yeah, but, but, moment. Right. But um yeah, but uh, but Walter White did let Jesse's girlfriend Stop. That was the most disturbing thing in Breaking Bad, wasn't it? Except, you know, she was going to die anyway. She was leading him to his death. They were going to overdose and die anyway, right? That's just a reality. Heroin is like that. You don't you don't come back, right? And she had well, demonstrated. Well, Jesse could. Jesse was going to come back from it. Why wouldn't this girl? He, he made an estimation, Walter White, mm -hmm. that yeah. because remember that Jesse was trying to save her. And then she was dragging him back into the heroin use. Right, right. And right. Walter White, like, basically, you don't know. Like, it is extremely creepy when he does that. Mm -hmm. But but it's also the case. I mean, the other thing that he does is he poisons the woman's uh, child. Oh, yeah, that's a really bad one, too. That's another, But also with something where the child isn't going to die. Right. Because right? he's a chemist and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, but again, the drama of the show, and this is also true of Ozark, is that you're not sure. You're like, wait is this person really bad? Like what's going on here? Can I go with this or not? Right. Do you think but, that, do you think that the parents in Ozarks are really bad? Ultimately? Well, okay. Dude, you know, is, is not, although you wonder, but then what's funny about the other family members is that they try to be bad. In other words, they're like, Oh, we're criminals now. So now we're going to do bad things and they fuck it up. Right. Mm -hmm. It all, I mean, you'll see if you watch it all the way through um, like Wendy, the wife, tries to like be even more ruthless mm -hmm. than Marty, but she fucks it up. In other words, she doesn't, you know, and she also does questionable things that are bad, like, you know, like set up her brother to be killed. Mm -hmm. okay, maybe you haven't seen that yet. I have. Oh, okay. Right. And yet obviously the brother is self-destructive and is going to bring down the family. And so, you know, but anyway, both his wife and his two children, they all try their hand at now I'm a bad guy. We're we're on we've we've crossed the line, we're criminals now, right? But they actually are not able to do it the way Marty does it. And so that was my point in my article, is that Marty's a survivor and he, you know, exhibits bourgeois coldness in the Adorno sense, um, and that that's a virtue, not a vice. It's, it's, it's not bad. It is good, but you're not sure until you see the results, right? In other words, mm -hmm. and, and it's also, he may not be sure entirely either, but he's more sure than the other characters. So there are these other characters who are, and I think that I point out the, um, the woman who was the cartel attorney and how she's mm -hmm. like a cynical cutthroat person mm -hmm. and who's just like coldly executed. Right. Right. And, you know, and actually Marty's not that. Right? right. Even though it's kind of like, are they in a competition for who's going to be the most cutthroat? Like, it seems like that's what it is. 
that Marty's learning to be as cutthroat as this woman who's been the cartel lawyer for years. And so she's learned how to be cynical and cutthroat. And maybe he's following her down that path. But mm -hmm. then he doesn't. He doesn't. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and there are all sorts of other characters, FBI agents and, you know, the, the lead FBI agent, you know, she's basically too good for her own good, meaning like she gets herself into trouble by trying to be righteous. Whereas the other right. FBI agents are totally corrupt and totally cynical, you know, whether her underlings or her bosses, they're just totally, they're as depraved as the world that they inhabit, whether it's the political world of the state or the underworld of the, 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 the drug people, you know, like the black uh, FBI agent who has sex with the, who goes gay to be, to try to ensnare the hillbillies right? Mm. But it's just a manipulation, right? And, and again, so there are all these characters who are seem to be making their way in the world. That didn't work out for him very well, it did, did it? Not, no, that's the thing. So uh, for everybody else, it doesn't work out. For Marty, it does work out. And of course, it's a total fantasy, complete total fantasy, but it's an interesting mm. one. Mm -hmm. Because again, the What's way the, what is the fantasy there that, that you can, you that can you get can. a... You, that you can be just cynical and corrupt enough, but not all the way? Or what is the... No, that you can... Um, it's actually not that, right? So he... You know, it's like the Walter White analogy would be this. Walter White is trying to make like a good product, right? Mm -hmm. Meth that isn't going to poison people. And, mm -hmm. you know, right? So as in comparison to the others. So he can... Somebody's going to make meth... So why not him, who knows how to make good meth, and it's also not going to poison people, meaning, yes, it might kill them, they might have all sorts of bad consequences from taking meth, but it's not going to be like an accidental poisoning the way the other labs are producing like mm -hmm. bad meth. You know, so he's just like, okay, people are going to take meth, I need to make this money, I can do this, and I can do it in the most ethical way possible, mm -hmm. right? That's the analogy, is that Marty is like, oh, everybody can win. You know, that he's just gonna, he's gonna figure out the solution that's in everybody's interests. And everybody mm. can win, right? And it's a mm. very bourgeois fantasy in the sense of, we don't have to kill each other, actually. We can all be pursuing our self-interest, but everybody Right, right, can. yeah. Right, and I thought that's interesting, especially because, like I said, the compact people are very anti-market, mm -hmm. you know, anti-neoliberal, and I was like, well, you don't understand Adam Smith then, or even mm -hmm. Kant or Hegel. You know, you don't understand the, the, the bourgeois thought, which is that it's not a choice between self-interest and altruism. It is mm -hmm. society is not a choice between self-interest and altruism. Right. That's the point, right? It's not the war of all against all. It's not feudalism. It's not, you know, gang warfare, or at least it could not be that. Now, of course, in capitalism, it is that, right? And so in that way, of course, the fantasy of Ozark is that it it, it is completely untrue to capitalism. It's a bourgeois fantasy. Well, you know? if, okay. Yeah, well, I'm going to talk as a CEO for a moment, as someone who's newly found themselves in the position of being CEO. And, and, uh, and I'm doing things um, that I would never have expected that I would do, like going online and looking up how to be a good ceo what makes a great ceo what a hell <laughs> what a hell right. that is yeah i know and that's um, all self delusions on the part of these people isn't it well it, it it is but um one of the things that um i decided as i've been going along is that making everyone happy is a sure path to destruction that oh yeah well you can't no you can't make everyone happy you can't do yeah. you remember, Doug, with the financial crisis with 2008, mm -hmm. there was, in mainstream journalism, there was a bunch of articles, are CEOs psychotic? Right. Remember those? Mm -hmm. And it, they kind of made a case. And it wasn't like a Freudian case or anything. It was just a much more DSM kind of basic. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. like, does, do these personalities fit these criteria of like mm -hmm. narcissistic personality disorder? Yeah, The Corporation was a movie that came out that argued that the corporation as an individual is a sociopath because corporations are people. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. So corporations. Absolutely. Are sociopaths. And that's better than American psycho, mm -hmm. which is much more personalizing. Mm -hmm. 
of it, right? And, you know, because, again, I feel like the, we had a cultural moment where it was, and it kind of continued for a while. I think there was, like, this show called Billions, mm-hmm. where it's, like, behind every financier or CEO is really a psychopath. Like, you know, behind the mask of the businessman is actually a psychopath. And yeah. That, it self, that the role self-selects for such people. May, maybe, maybe not. I think that that's, I think the issue about what you're saying about corp- corporations is more true to the situation, meaning it's a structural thing. It's not a personal thing. It's not about are the right people in the right positions or what does it mean to live in a society where we need people to be psychopaths in order to get things done. Like, you know, that that kind of angst that people had, because it did look like that, to, you know, it looked like Bernie Madoff, whatever. Like, it looked like, oh, how did the financial crisis happen? It's because society's run by psychos. And it's like, right. you know? That is not the reason. At the same time, it does raise interesting questions about about this. When I when I first started, and it was actually before I even founded Sublation, it was when I was undergoing a battle with my former employee, and there were mm-hmm. lawyers involved, and all of that. Um, oh, exactly. <laughs> um, a friend of mine gave me a pamphlet that was saying everything you need to know about corporate America and and surviving in the corporate structure you can learn from the television show the office and it broke uh, it broke <laughs> which one down. Though, the american office or the british <clears throat> the, office? um the american and yeah. and it uh, and it broke people down into types like uh, the, you know so the the sociopaths were on top um and then in the middle there were the dupes and the fools right and like michael scott and then in oh, on, yeah, exactly. on the bottom there were the defeated Right. And, oh, totally. Totally. and and to win, you couldn't be a dupe or a fool. You couldn't believe in the company. You couldn't be invested, narcissistically oh, invested. To survive, in you'd be better off as a defeated. Well, to survive, you'd probably be better <laughs> off as a defeated. But to win, oh, you, you to had be to be a sociopath. You have to be, uh, you know, operating on the level of duplicity. Right. And, so this is, though, this is my point, is that what I had to say about Ozark was that these anti-heroes, especially the kind of flinch from the anti-hero, like not Tony Soprano, right. but Walter White or Marty Bird or mm-hmm. Jimmy McGill, Saul Goodman in Better Call Saul, that actually they are, they are not sociopaths. In other words, you wonder, but in the right. end, they're not. And, and that's part of, that's the dramatic tension, if you will. And also these funny sh- TV shows that are very different from the TV shows. I feel that we grew up with, which were mm-hmm. much more episodic, like TV shows that have long arc of character development, like of consistent character development, not just can, how do we keep the character interesting over the course of several mm-hmm. seasons, but a much more thoroughly developed character arc. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's new. That's more more recent. Although I was watching, you know, speaking about being in the lockdown, I ended up watching Magnum PI. You know, with Tom yeah. Selleck. It's kind How of is deep, that? It's a deep show. It's, it's better than I remember. It. He's a traumatized Vietnam veteran who has flashbacks. It's and all of his like people that he works with are all like from his they're all fellow veterans from his unit in Vietnam, and that's the basis of their bonding, and they're all struggling with PTSD. It's like a lot. And then the, the, the guy who he works for is also like a World War II PTSD, like British ex-British officer. It's, mm. you know, the 80s entertained things. And I think, you know, we were too young to appreciate what the culture was processing. You know, mm-hmm. it's like Hell Street Blues or something is much, much, much more than anything now. We should, we should, I should watch that again. I should watch those. I should return to those. It would be a nice, warm, fuzzy, nostalgic trip. And but then it will turn out more, to be more. Than yeah, that. it's more than you'll you'll expect. And so anyway, but yeah. So the that's this question of, I don't think. I don't know. I mean, obviously, a lot of entrepreneurship is luck. It's circumstantial. Yeah. It's contingent. You know, um, and you know, I think it is a constant ethical dilemma. It is. It, it, it is a. The, the truth of it is, I'm learning is that it is a. Um, it's it's always a bet. It's mm-hmm. always going to involve risk. You can't you you do not know in advance what's going to happen. 
Absolutely but, and, not. Yeah. And because of that, you have to evaluate the circumstances in front of you and take what you think is the best bet. It's you what, know? it's how you're, it's how you're, um, and again, that's where I feel like when you're an audience for one of these TV shows, you're watching the character make their, take their risks, make their gambles, right. place their bets, if you will. Mm -hmm. And you are, you're both identifying with them. You're putting yourself in their position and saying, would I make that decision? But you're also allowing them to be their own character. You know, like, mm -hmm. okay, maybe this person is not me, is going to make a decision that I would not make. And then there's a kind of a dissonance and then how it plays out, how it resolves them, right? And so you're constantly judging and you are identifying with, but you're also kind of going along with and also, you know, we want these characters to do things that we would not do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Again, mm -hmm. you know, that's the fantasy, that's the escapism, that's the exaggerated, you know. Um, it's like, you know, even if when it's a direct identification, like like in a dream, you might find yourself doing something that you wouldn't do. There was um, there's a scene in Ozarks where for a while the the the, the two main characters, the husband and wife, are having some trouble in their marriage, mm -hmm. and. Um, not to be too personal, that I watched that at a time where I was having trouble oh, yeah. going down. Uh -huh. And um, uh, they do a, there's a scene where they go to a counselor. Uh -huh. and, oh, and right. They're, they're, they're getting therapy. Right. And at the end of it, uh, the husband character goes into the kitchen where the therapist is and like gives her a big wad of bills. Pays says, her off to right side. Right. And I and to me, I was like, "Oh man, that's what I've been needing. To, that's what I've been sh should be." That's, doing. What that's that's everybody's fantasy. He's ever been in couples therapy. <laughs> yeah, right. like, what can I do to get the therapist on my side? Well, right. if only I could pay them off. Right. Or something. Um, and it's just, right? so yeah, yeah. Obviously, or, in reality, it doesn't matter whose side the therapist is on, really. Right. But <laughs> the therapist is not going to be able to. That's the whole fantasy of couples counseling. Is like the therapist. No, it's a good. It. This show. I felt like it was like a couple's show, like me and my partner watching it. Like I did, you know, because it is about like the, the bond of the marriage being tested right. by all these dramatic revelations and then attempts to go along with, but then like not being able to go along with each other's actions and this kind of thing. I mean, in the end it is a little bit patriarchal in the sense that the husband is more rational in his judgment than the wife is. He does handle things better than her. And, you know, and again, it does have a kind of implicitly social conservative, but again, it's, you know, I think that I talk about this in the article, it's like, okay, what about the straight white male redemption of this genre of show, right? Mm -hmm. Like, why do people not want to believe that Tony Soprano is a sociopath? Because they want the straight white guy to be okay, to be fine, to be morally acceptable is he i don't no, know he, he's just not <laughs> no, no he's not but i'm saying why you know because i would like talk to students i'd be like you know tony soprano's a sociopath right and yeah, they're yeah. like oh no and i'm like that's the whole point of him being in therapy and the therapist being like uh this guy's hopeless so yeah. just to return to adorno for a moment the point <laughs> of analyzing these pro these programs the thinking about these cultural products is not to say oh should we behave like no. This fantasy character or this fantasy character no. or who's no. the model to follow, but more about saying, okay, how do we get stuck in this position? And, you know, being stuck in this position, what are our, how do we proceed? But one of the things that you can never really, that I've never seen depicted on the show is uh, about someone who, you never see a show about someone who says, these Maybe there's maybe Mr. Robot is like this kind of. Oh but, yeah, Mr. Robot. Uh huh. Yeah, but these these conditions, these background conditions, this circumstance I find myself in, it has to change. I cannot uh, accept the overall background, and I'm going to do something about the it. The problem with these shows, like Mr. Robot, and then one show that that I watched was Homeland, mm -hmm. is one of the ways that the show kind of dodges the issue is to have mental illness on the part of the main character be a, be a kind of a thematic where there is the robot. You mean, I think, or yeah, yeah. And then, and in Homeland also. Um, and mm -hmm. so, you know, where it's this, it's, it's kind of like it, it 
creates an interesting conundrum for the viewer. No, I mean, it, it, what Mr. Robot ultimately said is all you need to do is vote for Hillary Clinton. Yeah, and that was, so you know, <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, it was bad, just, I know. But along the way, it entertains yeah. some other things. Yeah. 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 And so, no, I mean, the, the Adorno point is not. Okay. So I think that this is just at a very primitive level, like mm. speaking to our viewers here. Mm. What do leftists want from culture? They want propaganda. They want role models. They want models of ethical behavior. Children, no. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to our viewers now, no. No, mm -hmm. no, no. That's not what culture is for. That's not what art is for. It is not. It's not, I want to see good guys I can identify with succeed, and I want a model of behavior to follow. That's the authoritarianism. And the degree to which art and culture is worth anything at all, it plays with that authoritarianism, but also plays against it, like plays in it, plays with it, plays against it, which also the viewer wants. In other words, the guilty pleasure, but also the space for ambiguity, the space for ambivalence, the space for contradiction. Because, of course, when viewers want, I want the right political message. I want the right model of behavior. I want the, you know, kind of instructive, propagandistic, didactic. Mm -hmm. What they're denying is contradiction. This society is contradictory. It's not about taking sides. It's not about good and bad, right and wrong, good and evil. Mm -hmm. It's not. And that was my point of the Star Wars article. Mm -hmm. Is like, why did people not like the prequels? Because, because it's not good versus evil. It really isn't. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, even though it's extremely good versus evil, it also isn't good versus evil. You know, it's Yoda, who's like the paragon of virtue, having to accept that he failed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to, to what you said at the end there about what art is for reminded me of um, something that Philip K. Dick once said about Ursula Le Guin. Because you know, I'm com coming out of the science fiction. Yeah, yeah, no. And I know, yeah. I know the reference, so go for it. Yeah. So Philip K. Dick was criticizing Le Guin, saying, uh, you know, it, it, all she does is write whatever the party line is coming out of Berkeley. You know, she just all she is is like a liberal sociologist. It can seem that way. Yeah, I mean, it, he's, he's I not. Think it's not much more uh, interesting than that. I think so too, but but um, at times, at and first at times glance. not. At times yeah. not. Okay. Yeah. But at but at times it's much more interesting than that. Whereas Philip K. Dick, he was a religious nut. Like he he, uh, you know, he had epiphanies and personal belief. Yeah, but he but he was completely in on it. Like like the, what I mean by that is he didn't waver. He didn't try to falsely resolve anything. He went all the way to the end. Cultural conservatives can be better artists, right? They can because again, it's not a, it's not like okay to be a good artist. What you should be a Marxist who understands capitalism? No. No, that's not, that's not going to make you a good artist. Um, what makes one a good artist is the ability to spontaneously produce mm. the contradiction. Right? Mm. And so actually being like a theorist who's aware of the contradiction of capitalism might be inimical to making good art. Because no, it isn't. Because so self-conscious about be quiet, just Chris. doing I it. I do not want to hear this from you. I, just, I, I want to do both. I want to hold on to my art. but um, Or maybe, luckily, I don't understand the contradiction of capitalism. The, one of those two things. Or maybe but, you <laughs> understand it in one domain, political economy, and not in the aesthetic domain. And so, therefore, innocent of it. I mean, again, right. it, I'm not saying, right. you know, being a Marxist socialist can prevent you from being a good artist. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying you certainly do not have to be a Marxist socialist to make good art. Definitely yeah. not. And in right. fact, it might work against it. Whereas someone who's just spontaneously, because, you know, the, the virtue of the right mm -hmm. is that they can be incoherent. Mm -hmm. That's their virtue. That's also the key to their political success is that they mm -hmm. can just do contradiction. They can just be contradiction. And that works. Mm -hmm. That's very effective, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's total opportunism, and it can it can encompass things in a way that that is is gets real traction and is effective, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, that just works, you know. And so, 
it works in the realm of politics. It also works in the realm of art, right? Mm -hmm. So being able to sort of put aside, I mean, a lot of modernist visual art was produced by kind of mystics, you know, like theosophists and, or like primitivists or kind of anthropologists, you know, like a, a Barnett Newman or Mark Rothko being influenced by like Machu Picchu and, you know, very romantic kind mm -hmm. of view of things. And, you know, God bless, meaning good, you know? So it's not like you can go back and say, well, what's the ideology of the artist? What's their social message? That's not, you know, it's, it, it isn't the way art works. Mm -hmm. It's also not what art is good for, even politically, because politically we need art to be able to express contradiction. And again, that's where the cultural critic comes in. Mm -hmm. The cultural critic can bring that out or at least try to bring it out, um, you're not gonna secure it. It's not like, okay, now people will see the contradiction. No, it's, it's a fairly contingent, ephemeral kind of thing, mm -hmm. capturing the moment. But it shouldn't be redundant. In other words, the, the work is still superior to the criticism. It will always be, because it's doing something in a way that criticism is only saying something. Yeah. Although I tried to do things also more in the Ozark article than in the Star Wars article. Star Wars article, I just tried to say, in Ozark I tried to do, and they tried to scrub out a lot of that. So I put in all these crazy references, whether it's other TV mm. shows or Three Mile Island being destroyed by the mafia corruption with the Democrats. Mm. I read a book about this. It's shocking, right? Mm. It's like, do you really want to go back to the Fordist capital? If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both. <laughs>